people marry for happiness, contentment, and a house where they can share their life experiences. But if you're going to base the foundation of your marriage on lies, no matter how pitiful they are, then you are indeed building your house on a swamp, which sooner or later will collapse. The world is filled with many cases where marriages break because of pitiful lies. Today, we will discuss the terrifying and unfortunate story of Lori Hacking, deceived by her true love. Lori Suarez Hacking was born in California on December 31, 1976. She was the adopted child of Thelma and Harold Suarez. But then, in 1987, her parents divorced, so she relocated to Orem, Utah. Lori met Mark at Orem High School, near Salt Lake City in Utah. She was an outstanding student. She got good grades and had a lot of friends. She was very mature for her age, but never missed out on having fun with her friends. She was adventurous and had a curious personality. Mark Hacking was born into a very large Mormon family. He was very athletic and would often go hiking around the trails of Utah. Lori and Mark met with some friends on a trip to Lake Powell. Apparently, Lori hadn't paid too much attention to Mark until he stuck his hand in a campfire to turn a log and burned himself. So Lori helped him out and gave him first aid, and the two ended up staying up all night talking, really connecting that night. Soon they started dating, and then their relationship became much more serious. In 1995, Lori went to college in Weber and then transferred to the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. Then a year before she graduated from the University of Utah in 1999, she and Mark got married. She was marrying the love of her life and everyone around Lori was truly happy for her. She seemed at the perfect marriage and a great job. Everyone, including Lori, thought that she and Mark were happy until things took a fast turn and all the happiness turned into a dark tragedy. The couple were planning to move to North Carolina, where Mark was accepted to the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill to study oncology, but that would never end up happening. On July 19, 2004, the police received a morning call of a panicked husband who reported his wife missing. It was Mark. He told the police how Lori went on a morning jog and never came back. Mark woke up in the morning to see that his wife was not in the house. He was supposed to drive her to work at 7 a.m. after she came back from her morning run. But when Mark accidentally woke up at 8 a.m., he assumed that Lori had already left for work on her own. In fact, he was sure about it because Lori's car was not in the driveway. Not thinking much about it, Mark continued his day just like normal, and it wasn't until 10 a.m. when he called her workplace. From there, he got the startling news that Lori had never arrived at work that day. And while he was on the call with her co-worker, he realized that Lori's clothes for the day were still laid out untouched. Concerned, he called the police, but they told him that he would have to wait 24 hours to report someone missing. Mark then took matters into his own hands and went to the Memory Grove area of Salt Lake City, where Lori used to go for a jog. Upon arriving, he saw that Lori's car was parked there, but Lori was nowhere to be found. Mark was soon joined by Lori's co-workers and both of their families. They all searched the area and the track that Lori usually took for her run. Most of them even called the police and when the police arrived, Mark told the officers that Lori used to run along the roadway and only change path if she had a partner with her. The police then questioned Mark who was very sad. Mark told the officers about everything that had occurred that morning up to now and how he had checked the whole path. A thorough investigation was launched to find Lori, but no one could find even a single trace of where she had gone. They assumed that Lori might have been kidnapped. Everyone was especially distressed because Lori was five weeks pregnant at the time of her disappearance. Nothing was found until Lori and Mark's neighbor was interviewed regarding her disappearance. The neighbor said that Lori's car was parked outside the home at 7 a.m. When the neighbor left for the day at 8.30 a.m., it was still there. This information became confusing because if Lori came back to her house, then why was her car now at Memory Grove? The police then took Mark in for questioning. Mark was certain that when he woke up, Lori's car was not in the driveway. In such cases, the first suspect is almost always the partner or the spouse. But it was odd to consider Mark behind Lori's disappearance. And when the police questioned some of Lori's co-workers, they told them how they did not notice any change of her behavior. Everyone confirmed that the couple was happy, even their parents. With further investigation, the police discovered that Mark had purchased a new mattress on the same day between 9 to 10 a.m. Although it couldn't be used as evidence against Mark, they still called him in for questioning. 
Mark gave the same story to the police. But when he was asked to give a CVSA test, which is a test that records and analyzes the human voice, he refused. And that is when police became very suspicious of him and kept a special eye on Mark. The police then decided to look around the apartment where the couple lived, but they didn't find anything of suspicion other than the new mattress's plastic bags. Not long into Lori's search, the police received another call from a hotel half a mile away from Mark and Lori's apartment. It was 2 a.m. and the hotel reported a naked man running through the halls. It was Mark. He had nothing on except for a pair of sandals. Mark's family took him into a psychiatric hospital for his behavior, but the FBI profiler later said that it was unusual for a psychotic person to keep their shoes on. So the police concluded that Mark might have done that to divert the attention from himself because he was truly hiding something. It was not long after that that all his lies started coming out. Mark was known to be studious, but that was all a lie. He was never accepted at the University of North Carolina, contrary to what he told everyone. In fact, he never even applied to the school. This was shocking for both families because Mark traveled for his fake interviews and even sought help from Lori's mother to write acceptance papers for him. And that was not all. It turned out that Mark had never even graduated from the University of Utah. He was never studying. And when he told his family and friends that he was going out for his classes, in reality, he used to hang out at some department stores. Mark even lied about his job as a psychiatrist at the University of Utah, where in reality, he was a licensed healthcare assistant who conducted group activities. Mark admitted to all these lies, but didn't admit to any involvement with Lori's disappearance. And still, his and Lori's family believed him and helped him search for her. Lori was last seen at a convenience store with Mark on July 18th, the night before her disappearance. Later at 1 a.m., Mark returned to the store to buy cigarettes, but this time he was alone. When asked, Mark simply said that Lori had gone to bed. The police then went to the church that Mark used to attend, and there in the dumpster, they saw an old used mattress. But what was most confusing was that the top part of the mattress was cut out. Mark again had a reasonable explanation for it. He said that he and Lori had thrown the mattress out because it was old, and due to Lori's heavy menstrual cycle, it had blood on it. Mark's story wasn't matching the evidence, and that was soon confirmed when Lori's car was searched. It was discovered that the seats were adjusted for someone far bigger than Lori, and blood was found in the back seat. The investigators then also searched through the apartment where they found Lori's purse and keys, which meant that Lori had never left the house to begin with. The officers found blood on the headboard and the nightstand in their bedroom. They also found a knife that had blood and fingerprints on it. Mark explained that he was a fan of collecting knives. A warrant for a thorough search of the apartment was issued, but on July 24th, everything was clear when Mark's brother and father asked him about Lori. Mark opened up to them and admitted his crime. Mark explained how Lori started to learn about his lies. She contacted the university, where Mark told her that he got admitted, learned that he never even applied there. Lori called them to check for some financial aid, but was instead shocked with the news. She was devastated not because Mark wasn't accepted, but because he lied to her. And later, when she went home, the couple argued. They shouted at one another, and later Lori went to bed. Mark, on the other hand, was playing video games, and later he started going through his packed boxes. He found his 22 rifle. He then went to the bedroom and shot Lori while she was asleep. Lori received a gunshot to her head, and because of which, she died instantly. Later, Mark disposed of her body in every possible piece of evidence. And when Mark was caught on the surveillance footage of the convenience store at 1.30 a.m., it could be clearly seen that he kept on checking his hands, wrists, and watch to see if he had any blood still on him. Mark then came up with the whole disappearing story of Lori, as he thought he would get away with it. On August 2nd, 2004, Mark was arrested and charged with aggravated murder. The jury sentenced him and decided he would not be eligible for parole until 2035. The police also said that Mark had narcissistic personality disorder because when he was confronted by Lori, he couldn't bear it and killed her. Now that the case was solved, there was still one main thing missing, Lori's body. A search was made in the landfill of Salt Lake City, but months went by until her decomposed body was finally found on October 1st, 2004, three months after her murder. Thank you for watching True Crime Prime. Kindly subscribe to our channel and remember to like, share, and comment.